Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth CSIS GRIPS RSIS webinar. My name is Narushige Michista. I teach International Security Affairs at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, based in Tokyo. This webinar is co-organized by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, in Indonesia, the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Japan, and the Ratanam School of International Studies, or RSIS, in Singapore. This webinar is conducted in English, but Japanese interpretation is available. え、日本語でお聞きになりたい方は、え、下にあり、画面の下にあります、インタープリターというボタンを押して、え、日本語を選んでください。途中でいつでも切り替えることができます。First of all, I would like to invite Professor Akihiko Tanaka, President of GRIPS, to make welcoming remarks. Professor Tanaka Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, for GRIPS to host the fifth CSIS GRIPS RSIS uh, webinar. Uh, on behalf of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar jointly organized by the three centers of policy studies in Asia. We are still uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. In such a moment of great difficulties, however, ASEAN countries and its five partner countries, Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP, on November 15th last year. Although we are still struggling to overcome uh, the pandemic, with the agreement of an important economic partnership agreement, um, East Asia could become more hopeful about the future of its economy, uh, economic recovery in the post-pandemic world. Last month, the IMF revised its uh, uh, predictions of world economic outlook in a way, it becomes slightly more optimistic about the prospect of the world economy than in uh, October estimates last year. IMF now predicts that the growth rate of the ASEAN 5, that is original members of the ASEAN, would be 5.2%, that of China 8.1%, and that of Japan 3.1% in 2021. These estimates indicate that the Indo-Pacific region continues to be uh, the economic center of gravity in the post-pandemic world. And the RCEP will be an important institution in support um, of such Indo-Pacific dynamism. Today, we are extremely happy to have Professor Kunari Kimura, uh, Professor of Economics at Keio University, and chief economist of the area Jakarta in our webinar. I don't need to make uh, any detailed introduction of Professor Kimura as he is widely known in East Asia as a leading economist with his analysis as well as many policy recommendations on the prospect of international economy in the region. We are also very happy to have uh, Professor uh, Jisuman uh, Siman Juntak and Dr. Uh, Dipinda uh, Landawa uh, as discussants. On behalf of uh, GRIPS, I would like to thank both CSIS and RSIS to realize uh, such a wonderful panel for this webinar. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us look forward uh, to serious and interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tanaka. In November last year, 15 countries in East Asia 
and Oceania signed the RCEP, or Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, at the virtual ASEAN summit hosted by Vietnam. We expect RCEP will play an important role in expanding trade and investment in East Asia and Oceania. In this webinar, we will discuss RCEP and other free trade agreements such as the CPTPP or the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. How can we evaluate the utility of these new free trade agreements in terms of liberalization, rulemaking, reducing policy risks, and forming a pro-trade pro middle power coalition? Will the future be bright for regional economic integration in the Indo-Pacific region? To answer these questions, we have invited Professor Fukunari Kimura today. Professor Kimura is a specialist of international trade and development economics and has been working actively on the issues such as production networks, economic integration, and the digital economy in East Asia. Professor Kimura teaches economics at the Keio University and is also the chief economist at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia or area. We will ask Professor Kimura to speak for about 35 minutes. Professor Kimura, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for a very generous introduction. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'd like to thank organizers for inviting me to this kind of a very uh, important event. Uh, let me share my screen first. Is it okay? I think so. Um, okay, so let's talk about the ASEP agreement this time. Uh, if we see a sort of a media coverage, uh, we observe a sort of two extremes uh, of uh, the comments. First one is a very optimistic comment. RCEP is covering a huge amount of population and GDP. So this is the largest ever uh, agreement. Uh, so this is great. Uh, this is one side of uh, the, the coverage. Uh, the other side is that, that the quality is so low, so it, it doesn't make any uh, progress in economic integration. So this is uh, the other extreme uh, comments. I think both are uh, having uh, partially a sort of a true uh, truth uh, on RCEP, uh, but not really uh, get to the point uh, in order to evaluate uh, RCEP agreement. Uh, I think that uh, how we can look at how, how should we look at uh, mega FTAs? What's the roles of mega FTAs? I think this is a very important thing. And also uh, sometimes uh, people say that uh, just uh, signing, ratifying, and also making in effect, and then that's it. Uh, but actually that is not the final goal. Uh, the how to utilize mega FTAs and how to develop uh, that mega FTAs, that kind of aspect would be even more important. So, so I think uh, from setting up that kind of uh, starting point and then look at the RCEP, uh, particularly in comparison with the uh, CPTPP, uh, that's basically I like to talk about today. So uh, actually the role of a mega FTA is uh, changing over time. The starting from uh, sort of two roles, one is a further liberalization must be promoted and then uh, international rulemaking should start from there. So those are uh, sort of, uh, conventional roles of uh, mega FTAs. As a background, uh, actually uh, we are having a so-called, fa fa sorry, fa not factor Asia, factory Asia. Uh, so uh, the globalization is going on, uh, but uh, liberalization and rulemaking are not really catching up globalization. And, and so WTO uh, it has been a sort of slow in, uh, in making a sort of progress in the liberalization and rulemaking. So that's why we have to utilize mega FTAs to promote 
those two objectives. So, so those are still very important, of course, and the, these two are also one are two important criteria to look at the mega FTAs. But actually, uh, recently new roles are added over there. I think, as a background, we have the weakening of a rule-based trading regime, and then we have U.S.-China confrontation, and then COVID-19. So those are uh, new phenomena in the past four or five years. And uh, then, then actually we have to add two roles uh, for mega FTAs. One is to reduce policy uncertainties. Uh, say uh, the rule-based trading regime is a weakening. So that's why we cannot really depend on the conventional uh, common sense uh, of uh, international rules. Uh, then sometimes uh, countries are, are using uh, trade policy uh, for a really sh short run political objectives sometimes. And particularly in case of superpowers, nobody can stop that. So how uh, we can reduce such uh, policy uncertainties. This is one very important function. Another is to form a pro-trade uh, middle power coalition. Uh, again, uh, say superpowers are not really following uh, the rule-based uh, trading regime, then how, uh, of course, nobody can control them 100%, uh, but what, what middle powers can do? I think this is another uh, very important role. So those two new roles are added uh, for mega FTAs. So in order to see and uh, evaluate uh, the mega FTAs, I think those four uh, objectives or roles of a mega FTAs uh, would be very important. And also uh, mega FTAs are not static, but uh, should be dynamic. So we have to look at the evolving nature of a mega FTAs. So signing, ratifying and being in effect are not the final goal. Uh, we have to think of the ex expansion of membership or deepening of commitments, uh, or utilizing as a communication channel. I think those are going to be more and more important when we talk about the mega FTAs. So, so we have to look at uh, mega FTAs from those uh, perspectives, I think. So I like to talk about the mega uh, RCEP uh, in comparison and with interaction with uh, CPTPP. Uh, that's my talk that I like to talk about today. So. First, uh, I'd like to talk about the three challenges very briefly. Uh, we have to talk about those uh, for uh, much more in detail, but uh, so today is a little bit brief. But the first one, the weakening of a rule-based trading regime. So the turmoil started uh, particularly after uh, that Mr. Trump came into the Wash uh, White House. And uh, renegotiations of uh, FTAs, say chorus and NAFTA, that includes uh, many uh, elements of uh, protectionism. Uh, so that, that uh, in and out of uh, the agreement itself, uh, say uh, some, some existing uh, liberalization uh, commitments are delayed uh, and also uh, export, export uh, voluntary export restraints are imposed. Uh, and also the wage, uh, wage is uh, coming into uh, our rules of origin and the connect, uh, connect, connecting uh, exchange rate uh, manipulation issues uh, to uh, trade policy and also so-called uh, poison clause, say uh, the Canada, Mexico cannot have, uh, uh, cannot have a new FTA with uh, non-market non -market economies. Uh, virtually. Uh, I think uh, those are added uh, in uh, uh, renegotiated uh, FTAs. And then uh, Section 232 of the 1962 Trade Expansion Act. Uh, this is a U.S. Uh, domestic law allowing the government to impose uh, trade protection uh, based on uh, security reasons. Uh, and I, I, th I think this is obviously uh, abused. Uh, of course, uh, uh, say uh, steel, uh, steel and aluminum related products are having uh, having the tariffs uh, and 
for on imports from uh, some selected countries. So I think uh, this is an uh, obvious abuse of, uh, at least uh, it's not really consistent with our norm uh, in the rule-based trading regime. Uh, then uh, section 301 of the 1974 Trade Act, uh, this, is, uh, this is to allow the, the government to uh, impose some uh, retaliatory uh, action uh, against uh, uh, unfair unfair trade practices. Uh, so th this is actually used uh, for uh, tariffs against China. So, uh, so, so I think uh, uh, suddenly uh, this is really uh, directly violating WTO commitment or not. We have to go to uh, dispute settlements in WTO and decide. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly those are not consistent with our norm. Uh, at, uh, or common sense uh, in a rule-based trading regime. Uh, then then uh, other countries are retaliation, having retaliation or putting some countervailing measures or offsetting measures or safeguard measures. A part of them uh, is also inconsistent with WTO uh, policy discipline. Uh, so, so I think uh, in both sides are uh, uh, actually weakening uh, the rule-based trading regime. And then uh, the continuously uh, WTO is having uh, difficulties. Uh, say appellate body issues one, uh, so the US uh, government is uh, blocking uh, the new appointees, uh, new appointments or uh, extension of uh, appointments of uh, uh, members of uh, appellate body. Now uh, members are zero. Uh, and also the weakening as a negotiating forum. This is uh, not started right now but that 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 lasted for uh, from the beginning uh, so th those are a situation so uh, certainly we have to think uh, how to defend the rule-based trading regime uh, what uh, mega FTAs can do is of course uh, it's not a perfect job cannot can be done but what can we do I think I think this is one thing that uh, we have to think of the second, the U.S.-China confrontation. So the, uh, unfortunately, the U.S. stance against China is likely to continue in Biden administration. Uh, uh, actually started from a, a tariff war. Uh, that was terrible, but uh, that was relatively simplistic, but uh, coming into a broader confrontation now. Uh, so the, actually the national security or sensitive technologies, the de definition of uh, those was uh, is really expanded and a pretty ad hoc uh, manner. And then uh, we have starting from Huawei issues, uh, then export control is strong, strengthened, new foreign direct investment regulations are strengthened, uh, government procurement uh, is limited to, uh, uh, some, some uh, limitation is uh, imposed uh, for China, China or Chinese related companies. Uh, or uh, even the clean network, uh, excluding uh, Chinese firms from uh, production networks. Those are coming in uh, TikTok and others. So, so those are really coming in. Uh, so, so actually uh, from uh, the middle powers in the middle, and uh, we really have to watch very carefully how far economic decoupling would proceed. Uh, Certainly, some are pretty optimistic because uh, the U.S. and China are having a very close economic relationship, and many uh, U.S. companies are making a lot of money in Chinese uh, market. That's true, uh, but at the same time, uh, so national security or so sensitive technologies arguments are very harsh uh, in uh, Washington D.C. These are having a bi bipartisan support, so cannot cannot go go back to a sort of a no, nothing uh, zero situation. So in terms of industries, uh, commodities, uh, or so farm nationalities, geographical extension, we have to see uh, the, the boundary of uh, 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 decoupling, uh, but uh, we are not quite sure actually. And also the Chinese diplomacy uh, is also becoming very aggressive. Uh, not only against the U.S., but also other countries. Uh, so, you know, uh, a sort of series of uh, event uh, things uh, with Australia and, and others. 
uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. And also uh, Chinese side is introducing various kinds of export control and others. So, so I think uh, from both sides, uh, now in the middle powers, uh, having some sort of pressure of the decoupling, not only from the US side, but also from China side possibly. So what the middle power can do, uh, so uh, we, we would like to keep uh, good economic relationships with both because uh, we have uh, the really uh, so tight economic relationship with both the US and China. If we just look at the sort of economic aspects, we would like to keep good relationship with both. But how, how we, can we avoid being forced to choose just one of them? So uh, this is very difficult, uh, but uh, uh, what uh, mega FTAs can do, I think this is one thing that we have to talk about. And also decoupling will proceed. So how to reduce policy uncertainties. So, so this is again, very difficult, uh, but what mega FTAs can do. So those are things that we have to talk about. So COVID-19, uh, we had a lot of uh, confusion in uh, news coverage, opinions and others at the beginning. I think uh, uh, as Baldwin said in, at the really early, early days that uh, now we are having both uh, supply shock and demand shock. Uh, but if you look at that very, more carefully, then actually we have three kinds of shocks, uh, particularly in the context of uh, uh, international production networks. One is negative supply shocks, uh, initially coming from China uh, in February, uh, but in other countries uh, uh, having uh, lockdowns and others. So this is negative supply shocks. But actually, uh, that kind of shocks are relatively in short period. So, People are worrying about the disruption of production networks or uh, global value chains a lot. Uh, some are saying uh, in extreme that now this is the end of the era of uh, global value chains. I think that was a ter terrible mistake. Actually, this is a really short run, uh, short term temporary shocks. Uh, so particularly on the, on the side of negative supply shocks. Uh, then, then we have actually positive demand shocks partially say uh, telework related things, uh, uh, people are staying at home, so do it yourself uh, related goods, and also certainly medical related goods, uh, we are having uh, positive demand shocks. So, so we have actually the shortage of uh, face masks and other things uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, but actually those uh, issues are pretty much solved now. So uh, that, that was uh, fortunate, of course, uh, but again, uh, this is not really permanent shocks and we uh, take care of that pretty much. And uh, then negative demand shocks. Uh, this is a sort of common shocks uh, once we have a sort of a, a worldwide crisis. Uh, so actually in each country, we have negative demand shocks uh, due to lockdowns and prolonged social distancing. So, so I think we have to really look at three kinds of shocks. Uh, and then uh, we can understand the nature of uh, shocks, particularly in the context of international production networks. And actually, uh, macro depression is huge. Uh, so uh, particularly in uh, North America and Europe, uh, because they cannot move, actually. Uh, so the GDP uh, drops are huge. Uh, but actually, the drops in uh, international trade are smaller than that. Uh, then, uh, and also, uh, if we look at the financial sector and asset markets, uh, those are surviving pretty well so far, uh, uh, probably due to unprecedented mitigation policies. Uh, so so I, I think this is a big revolution of macroeconomic policy this time, so far at least. Uh, so uh, actually the production systems in East Asia international production networks have largely been intact so far. Uh, I think this is amazing, uh, but uh, if we look at the past crisis, uh, then we observe this kind of uh, robustness and resilience uh, in international production networks. I, I just listed some papers over there. Uh, so basically, uh, the machinery parts and components trade is much more robust and resi resilient uh, compared with the other, other types of trade. So, so I think the private companies have optimized production networks in considering both uh, cost saving efficiency and uh, risk management. They are not dumb. Uh, they did not. They they are 
pretty much are prepared for a sort of various kinds of shocks. Of course, this time, these are big shocks, uh, but uh, still uh, they are really trying to optimize their uh, production networks. Uh, However, of course, uh, if a negative demand shocks are prolonged, uh, then that would hurt production networks. And so we have to uh, watch very carefully. So from this, uh, one is a sort of concern, particularly for uh, medical related goods, essential goods, uh, uh, concern on the collapse of international commercial policy discipline, uh, particularly for medical and the essential goods. Uh, so some, some people uh, start worrying about. I think uh, this, this has, uh, of course, uh, uh, th there's a good reason for thinking of that. Uh, this is one thing, of course, we have to uh, talk about. Uh, and also uh, to make uh, production networks more robust and resilient. Uh, then actually uh, we have to have more choices in location and operations of uh, uh, production networks. So. Uh, actually, this kind of uh, uh, second unbundling or task by task international division of labor, only limited number of countries, only limited number of uh, uh, regions are doing this kind of operations. So if we have more, uh, more room for expanding and deepening a production networks, then we would have more resilient, resilient robust uh, production networks. So in order to do that, the improvement of location advantages and also the reduction in service link costs, those are very, very still important uh, in East Asia. Uh, this is just a picture of a uh, uh, so called fragmentation theory as a, a task by task division of labor. The important thing is a service link uh, because a task and task, each task is uh, on the production blocks, those are separately uh, located. So how to connect those, uh, this is a very, very important. And actually some, some service links are, are very much uh, relation specific. And in order to set up these kind of production networks, firms have to invest uh, in a long-term perspective. So once they invest, uh, they don't want to lose even if uh, some uh, temporary interruption is coming. So I think this is a mechanism that why uh, say production networks are more robust than other types of uh, uh, connections. Uh, this is just a, a, a Japanese uh, trade statistics, uh, the H, uh, HS 84, 85, 86, 89, 1992. These, these are uh, machineries basically, general machinery, electric machinery, transport equipment, uh, precision machinery. Um, uh, we have export side, import side, uh, parts and components, and uh, final products. As you can see uh, on import side, a big drop in uh, February 2020. Uh, this is mostly uh, due to uh, China. So, but uh, that, that is coming back very, very quickly. And then after that, uh, the bottom is uh, May, basically on the export side. Uh, this is a combination of uh, the negative supply shocks in, in Japan and also uh, negative demand shocks abroad. Uh, so, uh, but that is coming back too. So, so I think uh, in most of the countries, this is uh, the Japanese uh, figures, but in most of the countries, uh, the bottom is actually May, 2020. So we have to be careful uh, the, uh, the prolong the negative demand shocks, of course, for, still. Uh, but uh, actually the uh, figures are really coming back uh, with the bottom uh, in uh, May, 2020. So production system is still there. So, so that, that was a pretty robust and resilient. So, uh, so going back to mega FTA issue. Uh, so, so these are a series of mega FTAs uh, done by Japan. Uh, so uh, mainly I, I will talk about uh, uh, CPTPP and uh, RCEP this time. Uh, but uh, uh, in between uh, Japan concluded uh, EPA with uh, EU and also uh, UK is uh, really going out of EU. So, so actually Japan, UK, EPA uh, was in effect uh, at the beginning of this year. And also Japan, US trade agreement. You see, there's no word free trade agreement. And this is a trade agreement. Uh, so, so this is a, a sort of avoiding uh, uh, policy risks, uh, obviously. Uh, but uh, so those are, are really coming in, but so we will uh, talk about the CPTPP 
and RCEP from now. So going into the first criteria, first role, liberalization. As, um, uh, so, uh, so in market access portion, tariff removal is, I say, compared, compared to uh, CPTPP, certainly this is low. In case of CPTPP tariff removal ratio, this is actually uh, the number of uh, uh, tariff lines, number of items uh, that would have a zero uh, tariff at the end. So, so some, uh, some tariffs are coming down very gradually. So, uh, but that, that includes uh, there. But in case of a CPTPP, uh, tariff removal ratios are 99 to 100% for uh, all countries except Japan. Uh, that's, a, that's a big shame of Japan, I think. Uh, but that's a, so Japan is really retaining agricultural uh, protection. So, so that's why Japan actually 85. Uh, but in other countries, 99 to 100%. Compared to that, uh, RCEP is a lower, uh, of course, uh, but the uh, overall ratio is a 91. It's not too bad. This is low, but not very low. Uh, so compared with uh, actually ASEAN plus one FTAs, uh, actually we have uh, some additional liberalization over there. Uh, but if you look at the contents, uh, actually that, that breakpoint uh, information is uh, coming from a uh, uh, Japanese uh, website, uh, Japanese government website. On the Japan side, uh, actually uh, Japan, Korea, China are uh, connected uh, by RCEP for the first time. And then tariff uh, removal schedule is a little bit complicated. Uh, this is actually uh, country by country different tariff schedule schedules are applied over there. So this is unusual. Uh, usually, uh, if you have multiple countries uh, FTA, uh, then one country is uh, imposing same tariffs for other member states. Uh, but in case of RCEP, uh, it's not. Uh, it's not. It's not like that. So Japan is uh, uh, having zero tariffs for 86% at, at, at the end uh, against, uh, for, for China, but for Korea, 81. And, and the other side, uh, for Japanese exports, as a member states, Australia, New Zealand are having 86 to 100%, uh, China, 86, uh, Korea, 83. So this is a little bit unusual. Uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, what RCEP is uh, talking about. And I'm talking about uh, here agriculture, forestry, fishery products, and manufactured goods. Uh, manufactured goods, uh, uh, liberalization is there pretty much, uh, but agricultural products, related products, still uh, some uh, protections uh, remain. And, and uh, those are tariff removal. Uh, then actually, um, I have a communication with uh, my uh, long-term collaborator, uh, Kazu Hayakawa, ID Jetoro. I have to uh, give him a lot of credit. Uh, he's uh, really uh, start comparing a uh, tariff schedule uh, between RCEP and ASEAN plus one FTAs. Uh, then I say we can uh, certainly uh, Japan, Korea, and also Japan, China are uh, connected by uh, FTAs for the first time. So, so we have a bunch of liberalizations over there, even if uh, the percentage is not very high. Uh, and also actually uh, so CLMV related uh, so tariffs, uh, that portion is actually uh, more liberal than uh, ASEAN plus one FTA. So we have some additional uh, liberalization, particularly in the CLMV. Um, and also uh, rules of origin, uh, the uh, so first, in RCEP, we can utilize accumulation principle much more extensively. At the same time, actually, the, the details of our uh, rules of origin, that is more liberal than ASEM plus one FTAs. So, so they obviously negotiated to some extent, and also the liberalization is uh, uh, going, going. Uh, to some extent compared with ASEAN plus one FTAs. So uh, this is what uh, we, we would see that for goods. Uh, for services, actually this is a little bit uh, weird, uh, but there's a mixture of countries with a positive lists and negative lists. Uh, this is unusual, but uh, obviously they are trying to get negative lists 
uh, so uh, the uh, countries with negative uh, positive lists are uh, subject to negotiation, they say that. So, so they are uh, heading for a negative list approach. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is a, a much more liberal uh, than uh, ASEAN plus one FTAs. Uh, so uh, that, that's uh, what we see that. And for, for investment, uh, certainly starting from national treatment, um, uh, MFN, uh, and also uh, some performance requirements, uh, say prohibition of uh, loyalty regulations, and the force technology transfer requirements. And uh, for ISDS and others, uh, negotiation will be continued. Uh, as it said that they initiated within two years uh, after uh, the, the agreement is in effect. Uh, for ISDS, I know that uh, uh, in uh, many countries uh, having some sort of uh, uh, um, concern on that. Uh, so in, in, in case of Japan, actually, uh, most of our FTAs and uh, uh, investment treaties, we are already having ISDS. But Japanese are not really using much. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, Anktad's uh, 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 ISDS uh, homepage, I think they are listing uh, more than 1,000 cases. Uh, only five cases are with Japan, actually. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, already many countries are using this uh, way. Uh, this is a really a fair way to do uh, for developing countries or not. I think uh, this is a certainly arguable point. And uh, the Japanese were worrying about ISDS uh, when we talk about TPP. Uh, but actually, uh, so this is already uh, cases are accumulated over there. And also, um, not necessarily investors uh, Investors win, actually. So investors win case, if you look at that, uh, some bizarre cases are some there too. Uh, say particularly a, a sudden changes in the policies in local governments, but the central government does not help at all, uh, like that. So, so I think uh, uh, it's a reality that uh, many cases are accumulated in uh, ISDS. Uh, so this is good or not, uh, we can discuss. But uh, fr from the viewpoint of investors, uh, th uh, this channel uh, existing, uh, this channel uh, would give a lot of uh, uh, breathing room. So, so that's uh, what we have to really look at the cases and whether or not this is reasonable or not, I think. Okay, uh, so, so, so I think at, at level of trade liberalization, this is not 100% satisfactory, of course. Uh, this is coming from negotiations. Uh, so, so I think in, in five-year review, certainly we have to think of a uh, catch-up of uh, in uh, uh, liberalization. Uh, so uh, CPTPP is set a sort of standard of uh, liberalization level. So maybe not exactly equivalent, but I think it's a more uh, liberalization effort is uh, needed for in, in review. Okay, next, uh, international rulemaking. Uh, RCEP is a big agreement uh, in terms of the number of chapters. Uh, so we have 20 chapters, uh, 17 appendices. Uh, so the coverage of policy modes is uh, pretty comprehensive. Uh, then, uh, then actually, uh, if you look at the contents, some are just having a sort of title, but not much ingredients. Uh, but some are having some interesting ingredients. Uh, so basically, uh, th this sets a sort of starting point of future negotiations, uh, possibly in RCEP, possibly in uh, CPTPP, possibly in uh, under WTO. Uh, say that once China or ASEAN member states are coming into that kind of rulemaking, how far they can accept uh, those kind of things. So this is a starting point. So. So uh, interesting things, one is the chapter 11 in intellectual property. Uh, this uh, is a little bit far uh, from uh, TRIPS. Uh, so, so I think uh, some additional things are coming in. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, chapter, chapter 12, uh, electric commerce. This is very, very interesting. That includes uh, actually free flow of data and no data localization requirement. Uh, but the subject to public policy, national security, and other considerations. So it's actually, it's not uh, virtually 
uh, quite effective, I think, uh, but uh, two principles are there, at least in, uh, in, in, in a sort of titles. Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, this is interesting that China accepted these, uh, these words over there. So, uh, so I, I don't think that would change a sort of uh, important domestic laws inside China. Uh, but uh, how we can think of uh, the relationship between these kind of uh, commitments and the domestic laws and also implement enforcement, I think this is a very important uh, thing. And also government procurement there, uh, actually government procurement is not uh, included in many FTAs uh, in East Asia, but finally uh, that is included. The contents are not really much. I think uh, uh, so the transparency cooperation review, but I think this is a starting point for that. So, so compared with that, uh, CPTPP, uh, certainly government procurement, it's IPR competition are there. Uh, particularly in IPR, uh, so the US pushed uh, many items over there. Uh, the, uh, when we uh, have a sort of transition from CP, uh, TP, TPP to CPTPP, we had so-called 22 frozen items. Actually, the half of it is related to IPR. So, uh, so if a US is coming back uh, uh, or a sort of accession to CPTPP, then we will negotiate the 22 frozen items, uh, but a, um, half of them are so related to IPR. Uh, and also the, some novel elements uh, in CPTPP uh, so one is uh, e-commerce. They have uh, three basic principles, they say, uh, free flow of data, no data localization requirements, and prohibition of uh, forced disclosure of uh, source codes. So in, uh, in uh, new NAFTA, uh, USMCA and others, actually the last part is a little bit expanded, not just source codes, but the algorithm and others uh, in uh, Japan, UK, uh, APA too. Uh, uh, but actually, uh, this free flow of data, no data local uh, requirements, those are uh, actually if it's in words at least, uh, in RCEP too. So, so I think one very important thing is uh, how, to, how to enforce those kind of uh, criteria, uh, how uh, domestic laws should be uh, adjusted and uh, how the, the enforcement is uh, uh, um, uh, reviewed. I think those are very, very important. Uh, say, and, and also uh, SOEs, uh, so this is uh, also uh, uh, talking about uh, the situation of globalization of uh, co corporate activities and leveling the playing field. Uh, so those are there. Uh, then uh, global agendas, uh, labor environment are uh, there to some extent. Uh, so these are actually uh, the Biden administration may uh, strengthen uh, so those items uh, if uh, they would come back to East Asia. So uh, uh, we really have to watch very carefully. Uh, then a uh, third point, uh, the re reducing policy risks. Uh, when we uh, make an assessment of uh, RCEP and then how we can utilize RCEP, I think this is very important. Uh, then actually how far uh, RCEP can be utilized as a communication channel with each other. Uh, as you know that to say communication between Japan and Korea are so bad uh, for a long, long time. Uh, then actually because of the ASEAN initiative, uh, we can uh, get connected by uh, FTA finally. I think the role of ASEAN was uh, extremely important. Uh, in uh, from now on, uh, again, if we utilize RCEP as a very uh, effective communication channel, I think the role of uh, ASEAN is uh, very, very important. Uh, then China, uh, of course, uh, they are good trading partners sometimes, but sometimes a bit uh, giving a sort of ad hoc trade policy these days. Uh, how far uh, other middle powers can say something to China uh, using a forum of RCEP? This is challenging. Uh, but I think uh, that is one way to utilize uh, RCEP and in other countries too. So in case of CPTPP, uh, so US worked out, uh, China is not there. So, so I think that itself is a middle powers uh, coalition actually. Uh, then 
uh, how we uh, how to uh, think of uh, uh, middle powers uh, viewpoint uh, on uh, the U.S. China confrontation. I think this is a uh, uh, CPTPP's role. So reducing policy risks. Uh, I think this is uh, difficult, uh, but uh, how to utilize uh, uh, mega FTAs for reducing policy risks. I think this is a very important point from now on. The last one, uh, forming pro-trade uh, middle power coalition. Uh, RCEP actually covers the whole factory Asia. Uh, so I think that, that is a benefit. That, uh, benefit is coming uh, uh, and actually, uh, yeah, in, in history, uh, rule-based trading regime is really protecting uh, factory Asia. So, so I think uh, RCEP is not the perfect substitute, of course, uh, but uh, a partially rule-based trading regime is there uh, because of RCEP. And India must come back to RCEP uh, for its own reform and also for strengthening our coalition. I think uh, um, uh, I understand the many uh, difficult uh, political issues, uh, particularly with China, and also uh, some India, Indian uh, scholars are worrying about a trade deficit against China and standard, understand that. Uh, but I think uh, it's very important to uh, get connected to ASEAN's initiative. And also we, uh, we must avoid uh, the weakening of uh, the coalition. Uh, by decoupling pressure from both sides. So in case of CPTPP, now the expansion of the membership uh, is, is the issue. UK already uh, said that they like to come in. Uh, so probably this is the first case of accession. Uh, so uh, 2021, uh, Japan has a chairmanship of uh, the, the committee. So, so uh, actually the uh, details of the procedure of uh, accession is not uh, pre-decided uh, to my understanding. Uh, so we have to set the procedure first, but basically all member states should agree on accession. Otherwise uh, a new country cannot come in. So, so the US is, uh, UK is uh, the important case. The US, uh, I hope that they, they will come back to uh, CPTPP or TPP at some point in time, not in the short run probably, uh, but so is it the form of a CP accession to CPTPP or re, uh, restart of a TPP or talking about a new agreement? Uh, we are not sure, uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, in case of new agreement, particularly if we see the inclination of uh, the Democrats, uh, so actually Democrats uh, put uh, uh, a bunch of things on labor and the environment in the renegotiation of uh, NAFTA. So those elements may come. And the China uh, is uh, saying that they are uh, seriously thinking of uh, coming, coming into CPTPP. Uh, I think uh, three big hurdles for them, uh, liberalization, SOEs, and uh, 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 e-commerce. Uh, so those are pretty tough, I think, uh, but uh, if uh, uh, sort of reformers inside China are having a sort of uh, uh, power and if they con uh, conduct a really substantial reform, then that may be a good thing, I think. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, those are really, really, really tough uh, hurdles over there. But I think uh, from the viewpoint of uh, Chinese, uh, they, they may think that uh, this is just a matter of uh, negotiation to some extent. Uh, say liberalization, it's actually that Japan is allowed with 895% tariff removal. Uh, so this is not very, very high. Uh, and so uh, we really have to watch carefully a sort of a high level of liberalization. And also SOEs, uh, so if you look at the, uh, a TP, a TPP, uh, so Malaysia and Vietnam are allowed a lot of exceptions. Uh, so, and also uh, this SOE chapter is really effective on changing domestic uh, so, uh, things or not. Uh, those kind of uh, monitoring is extremely important. And also e-commerce, again, uh, so TPP's uh, three principles are great, but uh, is it really a uh, sort of uh, enforcement in each country's uh, domestic laws and regulations. 
uh, that kind of monitoring is extremely important. Otherwise, I think uh, the Chinese side uh, think that uh, this is just a sort of a, a matter of negotiation. I think it's not very good. Uh, China is coming in, that's fine, but they have to do a sort of uh, enough reform uh, to do that. So in conclusion, uh, mega FTS must be evaluated in terms of four criteria. Uh, that's my claim, uh, liberalization, rulemaking, reducing policy risks, and uh, forming a pro-trade mega and middle power coalition. And also evolving nature of mega FTS must be emphasized. Actually, this is an ASEAN way. Uh, ASEAN is a start sometimes uh, not very high, uh, but uh, uh, step by step, uh, upgrading economic integration. Actually, RCEP should, should be like that too. And, and then RCEP uh, upgrading, uh, utilizing as a communication channel and also supporting factory Asia are uh, very important. Uh, in case of CPTPP, now strengthening the pro-trade coalition is a key. So the East Asia must be more proactive for uh, WTO reform too. I didn't talk about WTO uh, today, but uh, uh, the East Asia was a sort of free trade, uh, free, a free rider uh, for WTO. So we have to be much more serious to support uh, WTO reform from now. The last page shows uh, references related to uh, my work mostly. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Kimura. Um, now I will turn to discussant, but uh, before that, uh, let me say tell you one thing. Now the viewers can start asking questions. And actually, uh, internet savvy, some of the internet savvy people has have already started asking questions, but uh, now everyone uh, can ask questions. And when you ask questions, please use Q and, Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, please do not use chat box because we are not taking questions in the chat box. So please use a uh, press Q&A button uh, at the bottom and uh, write whatever you would like to ask. Okay, so let me turn to um, discussant. Uh, there are two, we have two uh, discussants today. Uh, first one is Professor Disman who is the chair of the board of uh, directors at the CSIS Foundation in, in Indonesia. And the other gentleman is Dr. Randawa, who is an adjunct senior fellow at the RSIS um, in Singapore. So first, let me invite uh, Professor Disman for comments. And uh, we are running a little late, so please uh, keep it to seven minutes. Professor, Professor Desman, please. Thank you very much, Naroshi Gisan. Good morning. Good morning to Kimura Sahab. We have been seeing each other for a long time now. Good morning also to Tanaka san from Rips. Likewise, we have been seeing each other for a long time. We have been somewhat disconnected lately. I thank Professor Kimura for the very comprehensive uh, discussion of RCEP. Uh, I take this kind of discussion as kind of prelude to more deeper discussions that we need in the future on RCEP. As Kimura-san emphasized, we need to see the current ASEP agreement as a living agreement. It still leaves so many things to be desired, to be negotiated, uh, of which a plethora of very difficult issues uh, are waiting for us to discuss. I prepare one slide and I would like to base my seven minute discussion on this. And I will be going uh, very quickly through this slide. Number one, it is very important, yes, to underline that the signing of RCEP agreement at this time is a kind of a very, uh, very encouraging sign 
uh, and even though it is an oasis, it is a very big oasis. As discussed in many analysis on RCEP. RCEP is a very, it's a huge region and it has the potential actually to leverage what it has to push progress forward in the investment and trading environment. But the increment brought about by RCEP is actually limited. Uh, to me, the most uh, meaningful contribution of RCEP is that it brings China, Japan, and Korea together in one agreement. This is historical to me. And I wish to see this relationship flourishing in the years to come. But as Kimura-san discussed, uh, in the relationship within RCEP between these three countries, uh, many things are left to be desired. The level of liberalization is still under expectation. Uh, point number three, RCEP, I think, uh, is kind of enabling condition to revitalize global and regional value chains. I fully agree with Kimura Sar. Global value chain has not died. Uh, it will return, and I hope it will return uh, with new figures. And we know that within East Asia, we have so many growth centers. Uh, some are called growth centers, such as Sijori. Some are called special economic zones. Some are called free trade zones. And I hope that under RCEP, these centers will be growing uh, faster than, than they have been so far. I think given the difficulties involved in dealing with openness, relying on these growth centers, insulated centers, I think is a proper strategy for the near future. So RCEP as enabling condition for them to grow faster. Point number four, subdued announcement effect. Uh, people hardly noticed the signing of RCEP and that's understandable given the pandemic. And this is likely to be the case at least in the next two years. In the next two years, we are going to have to deal with uh, the health issues related to COVID-19, the huge stimulus the government has to put in place, exit from the huge stimulus that is going to be imperative uh, in a not too distant future, and also what is called scars of crisis. Because of this crisis, we are going to see output potential reduced in the immediate years unless we come up with very strong reform initiative. And RCEP, I think, uh, is one possible venue to push forward this reform. We should not underestimate this crisis-related scars, the decline in long-term output uh, trend. Point number five, as usual, regional trade agreements are meticulous in dealing with tariff issues. The same applies to RCEP, but they are not able to do so in dealing with difficult issues. Even issues as simple as non-tariff measures in trade and investment. Yeah? 
uh, we are dealing with it more intensively lately, but go, coming to a binding agreement is going to be very hard. And beyond that, of course, abusive practices of IPR protection, data traffic, Kimura-san mentioned this in his presentation. <clears throat> uh, how do we live under the so-called surveillance capitalism, surveillance market? How do we deal with traffic data? Uh, of course, there is provision under RCEP on this, but uh, we are yet to come up to a binding agreement on this. And one more thing, equalization measures. When we dealt with EAFTA in the past, we uh, placed this in as one of the core measures that are needed in any East Asian free trade agreements. Uh, and RTAs, I think apart from the European Union, RTAs have not dealt satisfactorily with this. In the case of European Union, they have sectoral schemes as well as regional schemes. And as discussed by Kimura-san, RCEP is overshadowed by CPTPP. And sooner or later, I think we have to deal with consolidated East Asian regio regionalism, consolidated East Asian regionalism, whether it is going to be in form of uh, FTAAP or an East Asian uh, agreement confined to East Asia is uh, an issue that we have to de deal with soon. Another important point, spirit the spirit of regionalism. Professor Disman, I, I'm sorry, but uh, we are running late, so... Well, uh, two more minutes, two more you... minutes. I think, okay. as underlined by Timur Hassan, trade agreement is not an end in itself. It is meant as instrument of peace. And RCEP should also serve uh, what Timur Hassan called uh, instrument of communication between members, particularly among the CJK. Lastly, Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia should elevate this RCEP as a new opportunity to rediscover openness, to rediscover our place in East Asia, which we have never really defined well. And of course, to connect to the rest of East Asia in a more meaningful way as we have done so far. Uh, this should be an opportunity for us to get business people, government people, uh, central and local governments to engage again in issues related to trade, export orientation, or foreign direct investment, human capital accumulation, etc. We should not leave this opportunity untapped. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. Uh, let me move to uh, Dr. Randawa for comments. You have seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Beth, uh, uh, Mitchell Sita. And it's indeed a pleasure for me to um, comment on Professor Kimura's very comprehensive and uh, nuanced uh, presentation. Uh, in the comments, I echo some of the points that have already been raised by Professor Gisman, so I won't uh, repeat that. But just to quickly summarize, I mean, so against the backdrop of three very destabilizing developments, the steady weakening of the rules-based multilateral system, the US-China trade dispute and the you know, so debilitating effects of the pandemic, so Professor Kimura has offered a very nuanced and informative analysis of how the principles underlying RCEP could enable middle power countries to boost economic integration across East and Northeast 
uh, Southeast Asia, and perhaps hopefully at some point in the future, South Asia. And uh, what's really notable are the tangible proposals to generate momentum for boosting integration, drawing on the principles he's uh, fleshed out of liberalization, rulemaking, um, reducing policy risk, which is critical in these days, uh, through the formation of a pro-trade uh, middle power coalition of which we are all residents here. So these are the principles on which I would like to expand and highlight the opportunities that I believe lie ahead for ASEAN and Japan. And perhaps also, if I'm not engaging in wishful thinking, um, provide the momentum and just to you know, boost discussions on a revival of the now moribund TPP in the form of the CC TPP. So what does RCEP do? It of course consolidates existing FTAs and the prospects are limited on that count. But as has been mentioned, by bringing together such a diverse set of countries, it substantially boosts opportunities for trade and with all the other beneficial effects. Most significantly, as uh, Professor Kimura pointed out, it lends clarity to the rules of origin um, through simplifications now that are far more generous and straightforward than other FTAs. And this makes it easier to use ASEAN as a production base and attracting FTI. Uh, I won't elaborate on the coverage. It's breathtaking indeed for the, the, the size of the global population, GDP, and the nearly $10 trillion and a quarter of glo total global um, foreign direct investment it draws. But what's pertinent out here is ASEAN's centrality in the design and execution of the agreement in bringing very diverse regions together and creating an FTA that goes well beyond the provisions of the WTO and discovered new ground uh, on e-commerce, intellectual property rights, some of the role of SOEs, hopefully, and of course, government procurement. And this at a time when many are shutting borders. So RCEP sends a strong signal, and that's what President Kimura also hint, uh, spoke of, a strong signal to the global economy that ASEAN and its partners in RCEP are indeed open for business. And it bears repetition that uh, this is the second most integrated region after the EU with strong trade relations with all regions of the world, including the EU, North Asia, um, uh, North America, of course, Oceania, and the growing links with uh, Latin America and Africa as well. So I'm gonna take the liberty of extending Professor Kimura's analysis to examine the possibilities for ASEAN in collaboration with Japan and the three areas that suggest themselves the areas that will help to boost productivity. Firstly, preparing for the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. Some of these already manifest in, in factories and um, service sector firms across the region in a piecemeal manner. And what's needed out here is a greater state commitment for investments, not just in technology in skills development, networks, and also assessing the very vital issue of the impact this may have on employment. And then investments in green technology. ASEAN is, states are amongst some of the most vulnerable regions in the world, vulnerable to climate change. And the third, which tends to be neglected frequently, is services trade, including digital trade, where ASEAN continues to be fairly protectionist. And there's, I think there's a great understated potential for boosting output and productivity. So at a practical level, this is gonna call for two major steps. Uh, two steps, um, the first of which we hear very often and that's digitization, including boosting regional network connectivity, assistance to SMEs. And very importantly, in this part of the world, very concerted efforts to boost, bridge the digital divide and impart digital literacy at the grassroots skill development programs again, and there's much that can be done in collaboration with Japan. I know JICA and JETRO are both already very active in this domain. The second is a relatively unheralded uh, area, and that's 
policy coordination where there's, I believe, tremendous need and scope. Something that's already underway, but this calls for a level of coordination, which is several notches above what ASEAN has achieved in the past. And if anything, I think the pandemic has underscored the importance of close collaboration amongst ASEAN members. And we have looming in the immediate future, the existential threat posed by climate change. And ASEAN is amongst the more vulnerable regions of the world with specific exposure to extreme heat and levels of humidity. There are a number of risks that need to be addressed domestically and in collaboration. The pandemic has threatened to reverse a number of economic, social, and development gains made over the past few decades, widening the gap between haves and have-nots. So the unprecedented disruptions that we've seen to global trade and uh, the synchronized demand, which Professor Kimura alluded to in global demand, could reinforce the trend towards deglobalization. Yeah. And that's where one needs to be wary. And that's where there's a strong signal, as uh, President Kimura alluded, to potential liberalizers in the future. So in these conditions, I think it's important to reassess development paths, I mean, by seizing new opportunities through deeper regional cooperation and uh, integration that would help and drive more inclusive, resilient, and uh, sustainable growth. A quick point on geopolitics. I mean, notwithstanding a sharp deterioration in, the, in relation between the US and China, I think there are limits to the extent of decoupling that can take place. There's too much in stake for both countries. Most US multinationals investing in China are catering to the domestic market in China, and this is gonna be growing. Uh, likewise, China's dependency on exports, despite um, you know, the new chain alarms, is still very much dependent on, uh, on, on exports, including technology exports. So I imagine, notwithstanding dramatic de um, decline in geopolitics, political relations, the changes are likely to be gradual. So looking ahead, and I'll come to the last part, Asia Pacific was the growth pole that uh, helped to pull the um, global economy out of the fin last financial crisis, the global financial crisis. However, things are different today. Growth across the region is very damp, is low, it's sub subdued. There was yesterday, there was a write-up with Standard & Poor's talking about the impact this may have on revival pro um, uh, uh, prospects. Just quickly wrapping up, the trend towards mega FTAs uh, pointed out uh, by Professor Kimura has a history that dates back uh, to the slowdown in multilateral pacts after the Doha round of talks until 2007, 2008, when the enthusiasm for trade deals started waning, and that clearly pointed out. And the resistance towards trade liberalization, if anything, has gathered steam following increasing inequality across the world, and particularly falling incomes amongst the labor class in developed economies where the strongest base for the Trumps and the Orbans uh, and others come from. And the ILO data, in fact, on this is fairly sobering as well. And this is what leads to the increased um, emphasis. Can, the can, can we leave it there? For the sake of yeah. time, we have to take questions from other people. Wrap, can I just wrap up with a quick okay. sentence, if I may? So um, what I just want to say was this provides a very useful counterexample uh, to the regressive uh, 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 global trends in uh, that, that are underway. And as Professor Kimura pointed out, the evolving nature of mega FTAs, it does offer a very hopeful and sustainable channel to revival of multilateralism. Thank you. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you very much. So let me um, take questions uh, now. So I will take two questions from the panelists on the screen. 
and two questions from the viewer. So um, if uh, any of you on the screen, uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. No question at this point? Oh, okay. Oh, Dr. Lee, please go ahead. Unmute yourself and... Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, uh, thank you very much Una, for the insightful presentations. Um, since we are running out of time, I'm gonna make my questions quick. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one of them is, I think economists have long debated about the consequences of regional trade agreement. And then some of them believe that they could serve as a, a stumbling blocks for multilateral liberalization because basically RTA are, are providing some kind of a discriminatory mechanism, uh, which is giving you know, priorities to insiders at the expense of the others. So I wonder uh, how such criticisms you know, will be applied to the case of the RCEP. And then the second question is, uh, I was wondering what you think about the uh, consequences of the proliferation of the RTAs including CPTPP and an RCEP on the existing uh, uh, WTO system. Because I guess there are some concerns about the tensions in between these multi-layers of the AEE trading systems. So I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, um, is there anybody else on the screen who would like to ask questions? Okay, if not, um, let me ask uh, Professor Kimura to respond. Yeah, so I, I think uh, how to think of uh, RTAs, I think we have, st still among economists, we have a sort of uh, uh, different views over there. But, but in the past 10, 15 years, uh, we, think, we thought that the particular in case of FTAs rather than customs unions, uh, so overlapping FTAs do not harm harm us much. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, actually private sector uh, will choose the, the most advantageous uh, agreement actually, preference, preferential uh, agreements. So, so I think uh, we had a sort of a psychological break over there that it's okay to set up a sort of overlapped FTAs, uh, spaghetti bowl, uh, noodle bowl effects are of course uh, complicates uh, the system of uh, the trade policy but it doesn't really hurt uh, the trade flows. Uh, so if we have a better agreement, uh, then even if it's overlapped, and that would be good. So, so I think uh, that one thing over there, and also in, in case of mega FTAs, a sort of a, uh, a, a sort of um, third country's concern is a bit different from uh, bilateral FTAs. Bilateral FTAs are uh, advantageous only for two countries in a sense, intentionally, uh, but uh, in case of our uh, mega FTAs, particularly uh, with uh, seeking of uh, some sort of accessions and the expansion of the membership, I think uh, the, the implication will be quite different. And the WTO would work, then that's fine, but uh, liberalization under WTO doesn't move. And also the new rule making is very, very difficult over there too. Of course, we have to continue working on that, uh, but uh, we cannot wait uh, because our uh, uh, economy is really changing, globalizing. So, so that's why we have to utilize mega FTAs. So that's a sort of a thing that uh, we start thinking. Uh, 20 years ago, many economists are against RTAs, but now uh, this is a reality. Uh, we really have to utilize that in a kind of a good way. So that's, that's uh, what we, are, we start thinking of uh, among economists, <laughs> uh, economist society, I think. <laughs> right. That, that's my uh, quick answer. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kimura. So uh, let me uh, take uh, one question from uh, the viewers. At, um, and uh, let me actually share it with you in the chat box. So the question is, let me read it. To what extent is CPTPP truly an insulation for metal powers? as this was not the initial idea of it. Why do you think that the US will not return in the short run? Will the US come back to the TPP in the long term? 
So that's the question to Professor Kimura. Thank you, good questions. Uh, the first one, I think that uh, CPP, TPP cannot insulate uh, sort of pressure coming from the US and uh, China 100%. So if you look at uh, Mexico and Canada, they are, they are really uh, getting a lot of pressure from the US all the way. Uh, we cannot insulate that kind of pressure. But, uh, uh, but at least among uh, middle powers, uh, we can keep a sort of rule-based trading regime to some extent. And also uh, possibly uh, we could say uh, something on uh, the, the worldwide uh, uh, trading regime uh, should be uh, pro, pro trade. I think uh, that's uh, probably we can do to some extent in CPTPP. Uh, so, uh, so by, by chance we lost the US. Uh, so, so that, that's uh, actually the genuine uh, grouping of uh, middle powers, actually. Uh, maybe not intentionally from, from the beginning, uh, but, uh, but I think it's uh, in, in a sense very important forum. Uh, then the accession of the UK is uh, an interesting uh, thing because uh, UK is uh, finally coming into Asia Pacific country. I don't know why, but, uh, but I think uh, uh, the pro-trade uh, coalition uh, may be strengthened by having the UK. That kind of uh, characteristics may be strengthened. And the US uh, may not return quickly uh, because I, I think a TPT, TPP has a really bad image in uh, Washington DC politics. Uh, so so many, uh, many, many people think that uh, in the short run, uh, probably uh, the US uh, cannot really think of uh, international commercial policies very seriously. Um, so uh, probably that's true, I think. Uh, but if uh, they are rational, uh, then I think uh, you have, they have to have a, a better connection to Asia Pacific, definitely. So, so I think it's uh, rational for the US to come back to TPP. Uh, but uh, uh, coming, coming back to a sort of a original TPP or not, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, because uh, I say in uh, NAFTA renegotiation, uh, the Democrats put a lot of things uh, related to say labor and environment, for example. Uh, they like to add those kind of elements in uh, Asia Pacific agreement too. And uh, then suddenly we have to do negotiation, signing ratification process again. So, so that may take time. So, so I don't know what would happen, but, uh, but uh, Asia Pacific is a growing region. So, so certainly if, if the US is rational, they, they should come back. Okay, thank you very much. So actually, let me ask uh, two questions. Uh, one is uh, about India. So India uh, decided not to join the RCEP. Uh, but uh, what do you think about uh, in the possibility of India participating or coming back joining in the RCEP in the future? And if India cannot come back, uh, how about uh, Japan deciding to uh, sign a you know, bilateral free trade agreement with India. So that's the first question. The, the actually, second, yeah, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Um, second question is uh, about China. So China has expressed uh, its uh, willingness to join the TPP. So how might uh, the US new administration react to this uh, Chinese uh, initiative or you know, kind of uh, overture? And uh, is there, do you think it's possible uh, for China to uh, join the TPP before the United States of America? Hey, um, the first question, uh... Uh, the possibility of India to come back, and maybe uh, Dr. Landawa would answer on that, I guess. But, uh, but I think uh, uh, India is not really coming into East Asian factory Asia yet. Uh, so the, in, in India has a pretty strong engineering sector, and uh, certainly they have to be coming into task by task division of labor, but actually not. So, so I think uh, it's, it's but, but still, uh, yeah, of course, and software industry and others are very, very important. So we have different kinds of uh, international division of labor emerging, uh, but still, in, I think India needs the strong manufacturing sector too 
because uh, that generates a lot of employment, particularly relatively uh, poor people can work in uh, manufacturing and also related uh, services industries. So, so I think uh, that makes sense for India to come into uh, production net networks in ASEAN and East Asia, and still the link is very, very thin. So uh, suddenly uh, already we have ASEAN India FTA, uh, but uh, the quality is not very, very high. Uh, so, so I think by uh, RCEP, uh, uh, some uh, investment climate will be uh, improved on the Indian side and also the connection with uh, ASEAN. I think that would change uh, the, the competitiveness of uh, manufacturing sector in India. So uh, particularly in the machinery industry is actually not just imports, but we are importing and exporting at the same time. That is different from a traditional uh, manufacturing sector like a a textile and garment. Textile and garment, one way trade, but in the mach machinery industries, two way trade actually. So, so I think uh, that kind of aspect should be understood by uh, Indian policymakers. Uh, by the way, so Japan, India has uh, FTA already, okay, but uh, not maybe uh, we can upgrade that sort of contents to some extent. Uh, the China, uh, China's uh, possible accession to TP, TPP and the US reaction, US may, uh, may not be very comfortable, of course. <laughs> And uh, so as I think uh, uh, that would put uh, some pressure for the US to think about TPP more seriously, so definitely. Uh, if China is coming in first, uh, then uh, US is coming back, then actually uh, all member states should agree on new accession. So the US is tested by China. Uh, that's, uh, that's probably they don't, they don't want to see. Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, that kind of uh, notion from the side of uh, China would uh, stimulate the U.S. to think about A Asia much more seriously. Did I answer your question? I think. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so uh, it's time to wrap up. Um, so we have learned how we are moving forward, slowly but steadily in terms of uh, kind of uh, getting uh, into a uh, or creating uh, free uh, trade agreements in the region. So this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on YouTube later. So if any of your friends or colleagues was not able to join us today, please let them know about that. Thank you very much, Professor Kimura, for the excellent uh, presentation and the kind answers to our questions. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Goodbye and see you in the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, commentators. Thank you. あ、今日先生どうも今日はありがとうございました。本当に。ありがとうございました。えっと、質問いただいたのがまあしょうがないかな。はい。Thank you, Thank you. Take care. Still COVID is there. <laughs> Jakarta a little bit slower. Maybe we should meet. Yeah. <laughs> for, for for the G20 meeting. Oh yeah, already. <laughs> next year, eh? next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indonesia will be sharing, so right. We have to prepare. We have to prepare. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, we like to have uh, some collaboration, definitely too. So sure, sure. I, yeah. I, will, I, will, I will let them know in the yeah, office. Great, okay, great. in your yeah. office. Yeah. yeah.
Sanki Paku Yusuf. Jump up, keep high. 